Hello class! Welcome to a new unit in a new era of our fourth quarter. As I promised last time, we are done with the geometry unit and we're entering something else. What we're entering is functions. Now, click attempt quiz now, dive right into it. You will see what looks to be something that you might remember from middle school. Now, this is not going to be as simple as the basic unit for the geometry lesson, which was like, you know, what do you call this shape? But it will be still technically review. And if you're new to this class, if you just joined our school fourth quarter, welcome. <laughs> welcome. What a time to join. Now, I often make the analogy that my class and the units within the curriculum are like a video game where I don't know if you guys ever played Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo, one of my favorite old school games. If you have some time, if you have a Super Nintendo, play through it during this time where you're at home. But what happens is you basically start each little world you travel to with a pretty basic level. It might only take you a minute or two to get through it. Not too difficult, not too many enemies. And as you build up and progress through the world, it progresses in difficulty to where eventually you get to face the boss, typically Bowser, at the end of that world. And once you defeat that, you move on to the next world. So in that way, it's like we're just arriving at the functions world from the geometry world. So this is the simplest assignment, but it's still going to be a little bit more complicated than the geometry one, at least at the beginning, because middle school algebra is something that a lot of people have different relationships with. Some people hated algebra in middle school. Some people loved it. Some people learned a lot. Some people didn't learn anything. Some people learned a lot and have forgotten it all since then. So I'm going to treat this as if you've all forgotten it all. I'm going to go step by step. And as always, you can skip ahead or behind or rewatch or whatever you need to in order to get these seven problems today on this lesson. All right, with that, let's dive into number one. We see here a line. Now, a little review here. This has a positive slope because it's moving up and to the right. You can always think of a little skier that is attempting to ski here. Woo, oh no. I don't know why the skis look like this. Other than, as always, I'm terrible at art, so there you go. And they're skiing uphill. In fact, if they were trying to ski, they would have to be use their, using their poles woo, to push themselves up the hill. This is not a fun time to ski, nor is it a fun place to have to ski uphill. Because it's uphill, it has a positive slope. That means that when I take any point here, and I want to go up to this point here, I have to figure out how far I go up and how far I go over. This is what's known as the rise over the run. And I can also see that I start here at this y value. Remember, this is 0, 0. And then I go down 1, 2, 3, 4. Right before you get to negative 5 is negative 4. So the first thing you're going to do to review here is you're going to see what is the spot on your y graph that it touches. So for me, again, that's negative 4. If it's up here, it'd be like positive 4. You're going to type that in, negative 4. Then we're all going to have a plus sign because it's a positive slope, that skier. And now you're going to need to figure out the rise over run. So I'm going to start, you can start at any point, but start somewhere on the bottom. And then you go up. I count one, two, three, and over one, two, three, four. Up three over four. So I need to put three slash four. You could also hit this little button right there and I use the slash next to the right shift key and then I need to press the right arrow to get out of that fraction and type x. Now typically slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b might be something you've memorized years ago so normally you write it as y equals 3 fourths x minus 4 but for the sake of simplicity and the sake of in intuition about where do you start and then where do you go from there I like to think of this as a start value and then the slope and then an x. When you have that hit check. If you've done it right, you should get the green check mark and an amazing response. All right, let's try this one. Again, if I'm going too fast, pause. You can even rewind. Number one. Now I'm starting here at positive, let's count, one, two, three. So I type positive three. And then you'll notice that the skier now gets a very dangerous <laughs> slope downhill 
If you're skiing on this, I hope you are very proficient at skiing or you're going to potentially get very hurt. And so it's a negative slope. I'm going to type a minus. And then how far do I rise and run, even though I'm really falling, I start on a low point and I count. So to go from this point to this point, I go up one, two, three, four, and over one. You don't even have to reduce it. You can leave it as four over one. And then again, put an X at the end. If you want to reduce it and put minus four, get rid of the one, that's fine. And if you don't know how to reduce, you can even use your calculator over here. It'll just tell you, hey, negative four over one reduces to negative four. But again, your computer's smart enough. It's fine. Even though it says that, you know, it says the answer is negative four times x plus three, it will accept it as three minus four over one x. All right. Now we have this one where it's a totally flat, it's like cross country skiing, where it is crossing at one, two, three, four, five, but you'll notice it doesn't have a slope because it's perfectly flat. So I could make it zero over whatever, but that would just go to zero. So don't worry about that. Just simply put whatever your intercept is and that's your entire answer. All right, so that was a little review of sort of what functions can look like on graphs. Now we're gonna talk about tables. So you can think of function as a machine where you input something into the machine and it outputs something back. So you have this machine, this function machine. And if I put a number in there like seven and it outputs me nine, maybe what this function does is it adds two. So if I put in 11, it's going to spit out 11 plus 2 is 13. If I put in 0, it's going to spit out 0 plus 2 is 2. This is an example of a function. And any function that does this, you'll know is a function because it'll have the same pattern for everything. No matter what it does, whether it adds, whether it multiplies, whatever it does to something. This is to be contrasted with what I like to call a slot machine. <laughs> this is a casino-like function where you stick in an input, say five, like I stick in $5, and it could output you $100, or your $5, or much more likely, less than $5. It'll only give you back $3 until it gives you back $0. That is not a function because it's not consistent. I'm gambling, I don't know when I stick an input in this function what it's gonna get out. That's exciting in some sense, but in terms of functions, it's not what we're doing. So know that all of our functions, if they're functions, will spit out in the same pattern. Okay. So for number four, it says, Evan babysits the neighbor's children. His pay, P, is based on the number of hours H he watches the children. The equation P equals 7H is used to calculate his pay. Complete a table showing Evan's pay for the domain of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So domain right off the bat, that means what are your inputs? So it says one, two, three, four, five. I can simply just type that in. One, two, three, four, five. And then we're gonna use the function. In this case, I've got seven H. That means he gets paid $7 an hour. So I can multiply seven times one, then seven times two is 14. Then seven times three is 21. Seven times four is 28. 7 times 5 is 35. If you don't know that, you can just use your calculator that hopefully you have up next to you on Desmos. Now, does this information in the table represent a function? Is it the same pattern each time? Yes. Yes, it is. There's not the same input that gets casino-like spit out to different values in the output. If I have 1, I know it's going to go to 7 every time. If I have 2, I know it's going to go to 14 every time, and so forth. This is going to be contrasted with number five, where we intentionally are going to have a word problem that is going to give us a situation where we have a function and then a situation where we don't have a function. All right. This is the same type of problem that we just had. We have domains one through five. Evan is babysitting and gets paid $8 an hour now. So I'm going to go up by eights. And again, if you don't know what that is off the top of your head, you can just use your calculator. This is a function just like the one we had, but now let's check this out. 
One week, Evan's neighbor decided to pay him $25 for two hours of babysitting instead of the normal rate. So this 25 right here, I'm going to stop everything and I'm just going to put a two here. Create a new table with an extra row for the amount representing the overpayment, both the regular rate for two hours and the amount of the overpayment for two hours should have represented. This always confuses people. So here's what I'm going to recommend. You, at least temporarily, just ignore this entire thing. And this table that you have up here, you're just going to copy it perfectly around this other row. So if I'm doing this, I'm going to have to write it because and I want to leave that crossed out part there. I've still got my two, three, four, five. And I still just copy what I had above. 8, 16, 24, 32, 40. Now it's going to look weird because when you check out that uncovered row, you're going to see that one of these numbers here, in this case, I have two that repeats. You might have a different number that repeats. And that three went away too. So three and 24. It looks weird. It looks very weird because we have two that repeats. And now our numbers still go up, but they have this awkward 25 of this overpayment in between. What I'm going to tell you now is that's fine. This is how it's supposed to look. It's supposed to look a little weird because the point is, this is an example where it's not a function. We have these twos now that are going to different numbers and are screwing up the whole pattern. Which means now, again, if you needed that, just rewind the video a few seconds and pause. Now when I fill this in again... By the way, you can hit the tab button if you want to not be clicking through, just having it skip ahead like I'm showing you right now. I'm saying tab twice. 40. Okay. This is not a function. Assuming I have typed that all in, I should get a green check mark. Yes. And look at all the green. All the green check marks in this problem. It just looks beautiful when it's all right. Okay. Again, if I'm going too fast, rewind it. Keep working. Number six. Jillian and... Renatia, never met a Renatia before, disagreed about the relationship shown in the tables above. Jillian said that neither, or neither, however you prefer, were functions, while Renatia said that one was a function. Now this is an interesting test-taking problem, because before I even look at the tables themselves, who was correct, and then check this out, it says blank is a function because blank. This is an example of a problem that if you know... If you don't know anything about it, but you know how to like sort of interpret the question, you're going to know the answer to the first problem based purely on the second part. Because it tells you and forces you to say which one is a function, you know that one of them must be a function. So therefore, Jillian, who said that neither are functions, has to be wrong. Renatia has to be right. Because it tells you, hey, fill in the blanks, which one's a function? And none of these options are like, hey, none of these are a function. You have to choose. So let's look, which one of these is like a slot machine, where I put in the same input and it spits out different outputs, like the $5 example I had earlier. Well, this one is a really boring function. It basically says, whatever you put in, I'm going to spit out 12. Give me one, I'll give you 12. Give me five, you give me 12. That's a function. It's just a boring function. Relationship two is that casino. I put in 12, I can give you one, I can give you two, I can give you three, I can give you anything because it's totally random, and good luck, I hope that you get a higher number, but you could get screwed and get zero. So it's that relationship one is a function, because each input has only one output value. Each input has only one output value. Okay, final one, number seven. We've got our inputs. We've got our outputs. We notice that we have 8, 7, 7, 4, and uh-oh, these two 7s do in fact go to different numbers. So this is a little bit of a slot machine non-function we have here. Which represents the domain of the relation? Domain means inputs, and inputs in order, and non-repeated. So my domain is 4, 7, 8, and my range for the outputs is going to be negative 10, 3, 8, 9. So of the choices, find the one for domain. That's your first answers in your inputs. In order and non-repeated. So there's only one 7 instead of 2. And it goes 4, 7, 8. 
Then we do the same thing. The range matches our outputs. So I in order. This would be only one that even has negative 10. And is it a function? No, because of that slot machine situation with our 7. Okay. Hopefully, you got them all right. If you didn't, maybe you accept just getting like a B or something. That's just fine. A 70% or more gets entered in the gradebook. There we have it. This is the first lesson of our functions unit. We will start on our second lesson after this. As always, I hope that this video finds you safe and happy and healthy and well. This has been your teacher, Dylan, still missing you oh so much. From across town, teaching virtual class away from class. Have an absolutely wonderful day.